How many contracts are you involved in? Think about that. There are contracts we sign for cars, buy a car, mortgage, you buy a house, employment contracts. You get a cell phone, gotta sign a contract. Uh, if you go and buy anything with your credit card, there's that little statement at the bottom. That's a form of contract too, isn't it? I hereby agree that I'm gonna pay what I just bought. Like the number of contracts we, we sign, it, it's, it's amazing. You rent farmland, like, I, it's hard, to, I don't think I could come up with the number of contracts that I'm currently involved in. And they're kind of the, the, the way of this world. We know how contracts work, too. We, we know how they work. Two, peop, two or more people uh, sign a contract to a set of defined responsibilities. Like we, we, the official uh, definition would be something like a written or spoken agreement, especially one concerning employment sales tenancy, that is intended to be enforceable by law. You probably wouldn't come up with that, exactly that if asked, but we recognize that, that, that's a contract. We are used to contracts having a certain set length, too. When I had my contract for paying back my uh, student loans, uh, that, student, that contract lasted until it was paid off or 20 years, at which point it better be paid off. Right? We, we understand contracts, they, they last a certain length of time. Five-year car loans, 20-year fixed mortgages, where we're used to, or if you can, uh, uh, no, you can cancel a contract with a 60 days notice by one party involved. We, we we do a lot with contracts. And we know how to enter contracts. If we want to enter a contract, we, we sign a piece of paper, and if it's a very important contract, there'll be some witnesses. We, ha we have an entire role for people who make sure that our signatures are actually ours. We have public notaries. That the only reason we have them is to make sure that when we signed our name to a contract, that really is a, a, a enforceable, according to the law, an enforceable contract, an enforceable agreement. And so contracts are how we're shaped and formed to think about relationships. There is a type of, of relationship that comes up in scripture all the time, but it's not a contract. Is Actually, if you look in Scripture, that's one of the words you won't find. There is no contracts in Scripture. There's a different type of relationship that I think is important that we can start to understand by comparing the two. There's a relationship that comes up and it's called a covenant. And I think it's interesting to compare the two to understand the difference because... Well, let, let's start with the verb that you use on that noun. Like, the verb that goes with contract, what do you do to a contract? You sign it, right? That's the verb that goes with that noun. You sign a contract. The verb that goes with covenant is not sign. When you verb a co covenant, the verb there is cut. You cut a covenant. Well, what do you cut? You cut it into stone. The Ten Commandments, right? Covenants are as permanent as the stone into which they are cut. Another covenant that is cut in Scripture is when the Abra Abraham, he is told, you must circumcise your children. That is cutting a covenant. The covenants are as close to you as the scars on your body, right? This is, this is kind of serious. Covenants are, are, like, they are just that important. They are that serious and they are that permanent. As permanent as stone, as close to you as your own body. Right? There's, we don't mess around when we're cutting a covenant. And it, it leads to this situation where you wonder, like, what does it take to break one? Like, has anyone here broken a contract before? Right? You all, everyone has, you've lived. I've broken a contract once. I had a CD, a certificate of deposit. It's a contract, right? I agree I'm going to give the bank X many dollars for X long, and, and then they're going to give me a certain rate in return for that. And I went in and I broke that contract. I needed to pay my rent in seminary. My student loans came in and I, I, I misaligned my timing. And I went into the bank, and, uh, and when you go into a bank and you break a CD, is it hard? Right? Do you, give, do you give people flack when someone breaks a CD? Probably, right? But no blood is drawn, which is good. Yeah, I went in and they looked at me and said, Are you, do you really need to do this? Yeah. And what did I pay? I think I paid like 90 days interest and done. Like, I broke a contract, so what? I survived. You break a covenant. Ooh, that's, 
That's a whole different matter, right? How much, to break a contract, you go and you tell your banker you're done. You break a covenant, how much effort does it take to break a slab of granite? That's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about covenants. One of the ways that families would enter into covenant with each other, if you're going to make a covenant relationship for the rest of your life, what you would do is you would take an animal and you would cut it in half. Now, I don't butcher a lot of animals. As far as I can tell, I've butchered three in my entire life, and they were very small. But it doesn't strike me that when you butcher an animal, you usually start by cutting it down the middle, right? So why would you... And then, so if you enter a covenant with another family, they would cut an animal in half, they would walk through the animal together, and then they would use... Uh, they would cook the animal and eat it together, which makes sense. Like, if you're going to start this relationship, it makes sense to start it by eating a meal together. But you would walk through the, the animal together with this sense of, may this be done to me if I break this covenant. What well, we just did to this animal, cutting it in half, may that happen to me if I break this, this relationship. But to, it's not quite the same, but as I read about this in Scripture, they're talking about cutting, cutting animals in half to make a point. I think of the Godfather. You know what scene I'm talking about? A horse has a very bad day? Yeah, that, that, that's what I think of. Like, we're, we're not messing around here. So covenants in Scripture are these permanent relationships that are initiated by God, where God says, I will be your God, and you will be my people, and here's what's next. And so the first covenant we're going to look at, we're going to look at a few of them over the coming weeks. The first covenant that uh, we're going to look at is the covenant at the very beginning. You expect it to show up at the very beginning, and it does. It's the covenant between God and humanity. I say humanity because uh, when we're talking about Adam and Eve, uh, Adam is, uh, in Hebrew, would be pronounced Adam, and Adam is made from Adama. Adama is the word for dirt, and so Ad Adama, dirt, is taken and formed into the shape of, of, a, of a person, and God breathes breath into it, the spirit, and, and then Adama comes to life and becomes Adam, right? And so this is like humanity. And, and so when God makes this original covenant relationship with humanity that is split into two halves, male and female, Adam and, and Eve. Eve is uh, the translation of the word zoe, um, from which we get the word zoology, study of life. So it's like Adam the, of all humanity and zoe, the mother of all life. And so humanity at the very beginning is given this relationship. God blesses them and says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and of the birds of the air and every living thing that moves upon the earth. That had to have been slightly confusing when you're told you have dominion over the birds and you don't have any like helicopters or technology or anything to be told you have dominion over the birds would be a bit weird. Like, I can't get to them, God. Thanks, but yeah. So, you told you had dominion over the birds. See, I have given you every plant for food. And the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall die. And so, as we read this, the best we can understand it, and I make no claim to have it fully figured out, the best we can understand is that humanity has this option at the very beginning to stay innocent, to live in innocence, not knowing what good and evil is, without knowing what brokenness is, taking care of the garden, which is the earth. All right, that's the first covenant, the first relationship. And, and we can ask questions about this. We can ask, like, there's an ongoing question, is the fall a good thing? Is the fall something like when a teenager tells you no for the first time? It had to happen so that they could grow up, but it's not exactly pleasant in the moment. Right? Is it something like that? It's a necessary fall to get to something better? Or, or is the fall something where it happens and then we spend all of life get, trying to get back to where that was? Maybe. I don't know. We can ask... We can ponder, like, the nature of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Was there anything intrinsically different about that tree? Or was it like you put some, your, your favorite pen on your desk and you tell your children, please don't mess with it? Is there anything special about that pen? Well, the only thing special about it is you told your kids not to touch it. 
and then they touch it, right? And then they have decided against their parents, and, and it, the problem is not the pen, the problem is the decision, right? And so is, is the tree something unique and special, or is it that God said, don't touch that pen, it's on my desk, I like it there, right? Maybe. I don't know. It, we don't know how long this period lasts either. If you look at uh, scripture, sometimes the most interesting question is about what happens in the white spaces. Like we get to the end of chapter 2 of Genesis and, and, it, and it, th there's the commandment there, don't touch the tree, it won't go well if you do. And then we have the start of chapter 3 where Eve and, and Adam sit there and say, hmm, maybe I will have an apple. And, and that, sp that white space between chapter 2 and chapter 3, how long is that? Is that hours? Is that days? Is that decades? We don't know how long that white space is. Right? So we don't know a lot about this, but what we do know is that at some point, a choice is made, humanity reaches for the tree, and that first covenant is broken. And so we have to figure out, how do we understand that? What happens next? I've been reading about covenants this week. I've been reading about uh, John Wesley, who was a, an avid reader of Scripture, trying to understand the whole scope of Scripture. And reading what, how he understood this, uh, what he talks about, what he's convinced of, that is in Scripture we see the shift. In the beginning of Scripture we have the covenant of law. Do this and you shall live. Right? And we heard it back at the beginning in Genesis, right? We heard the opposite, like, if you do this, you will die, has the opposite also. If you don't do this, you will live. And so the, there's this covenant of law. It, obey the rules, and you'll live. Do this, and you shall live. And, and then at some point, it moves to a covenant of grace, which is, accept this gift, and you shall live. And the gift, if we start talking about the fullness of the gift, would be accept that you are forgiven and accept that Jesus leads you on towards the kingdom of God, accept that you have a future and a hope and a purpose, accept that is the gift, and then live, right? And so there's the covenant of law, accept this, uh, do this and you shall live, and there's this covenant of grace, accept this gift and you shall live. And so where does this shift happen? Where does that shift happen in Scripture? Well, how do we often view the Old Testament? Like when we're reading scripture, we often say, well, the Old Testament was all about laws. Like all the things, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do all that. And then the New Testament was all about grace. Thank God we're under the New Testament because of the New Covenant and how we want to follow Jesus, where Jesus says, love your neighbor and we'll work out the details as we go. Because that sounds a lot more straightforward than all these laws, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And so the temptation, and what I would have done before this week, before reading Wesley and being convinced otherwise, what I would have said before this week is that the Old Testament is all this, this covenant of law. Do this and you shall live. And then we get to Jesus and Jesus says, well, actually, accept this and you shall live. Wesley disagrees. And what he argues is the covenant of law is what we see with Adam. That was the time when humanity could get it right. Right? Do this and live. Don't do it and die. And that, that period of time lasted for however long it lasted, for however long the space is between chapter 2 and chapter 3. And that after everything after the fall is grace. Everything after the fall is a covenant of grace where God continuously says, accept this and you shall live. Where the rest of scripture is the story of God trying to get closer and closer and closer to humanity if we will let him. Right? So, and there are phases to this, how God continues to get closer over time, but we're going to look at the first part of, of history. Look, if, if Adam and Eve is sort of the, the, the beginning of all humanity, one of the first people in history that we know the name of is Noah, right? And, and we know that something happened with Noah and a lot of water. Every civilization in the, the Middle East, every ancient civilization has a story of a lot of water. So I am firmly convinced that at some point in the ancient past, there was a lot of water involved, a very big boat and a dude named Noah. Like, I, I'm certain of that. I, don't, I would not call it a worldwide flood, because if it had been a worldwide flood, where would all of the water have gone? So it's not a worldwide flood. It was a local event with lots of water that makes this spring look positively dry. 
And so listen to what happens. God blesses, this is after the flood, they, they, after they get off the boat. God blesses Noah and his sons and says to them, be fruitful and multiply. You've heard that just recently, at the beginning, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Just as I give you green plants, now I give you the birds of the air and the, and the fish of the sea. You wonder if at that point if they'd figure out how to catch birds or not. Only, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is the blood. Right? Don't eat, eat whatever you want, but don't eat stuff with the blood in it, because the blood is the life and the life is God's. And whoever sheds the blood of a human by another person, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image God made humanity. Don't kill other people because they bear the image of God. So don't kill other people as a sign of respect for the God who made them. And you be fruitful and multiply. Then God said to Noah and his sons, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and all of your descendants after you and every living creature. I establish my covenant that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and the ever -living, every living creature that is. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Did you hear the, 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 the covenant of grace in there? Accept and live there? Like there, At no point in talking about the rainbow did it say do this and you live. What it was was saying accept that I will never do a flood again. Accept that as a gift and live. Uh, the beginning of grace in Scripture, the beginning of this covenant, this relationship based upon God's gift, is the rainbow of Noah. Uh, it is the reminder that from the very beginning, God is, is saying, accept this gift and you shall live. There will never be a flood again. And by the way, here are some things about how you might live, right? Be fruitful, eat meat and plants, don't kill each other, but don't worry about the flood. That is my gift to you. There is a lot of ground we have to cover between now and Jesus. Like, we're starting with, with Noah, and, and probably three, three and a half thousand 3,500 B.C., and we have a lot of ground to cover. We've got to get through Moses and David and the prophets before we get to, to Jesus. Uh, but I think it's important to, to notice uh, from the very beginning of all history, right, the, the, with the, one of the people, one of the first people we know the name of, of Noah, we see that God starts with, working towards us with this covenant of grace, giving to us what God can so that we might be reminded that God is the one who loves us, is going to do whatever it takes so that we might be in relationship with him. Thanks be to God. Amen.